uh, good evening uh, again, uh, everyone uh, and all of, of our audience uh, from all over the world. Uh, we are starting tonight uh, our Tuesday intervention nights uh, at the CT, which is streamed live on our YouTube channel. We will start today uh, this uh, package of sessions by uh, a peripheral uh, arterial disease uh, intervention in the case of an acute coronary syndrome and a very interesting case. And this will be followed in the next several weeks by the bifurcation campus organized by my dear friend, Abrahman Gamal. And uh, I will pass the mic now uh, to my dear friend, uh, Haysam Suleiman, uh, Rarib, uh, lecturer of cardiology at Fayoum University and co-founder of CEC. Haysam will be the moderator uh, of this session. So please uh, go on Haysam uh, while Mahmoud uh, start preparing the slides. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're glad to, uh, to have you on board in the first uh, intervention session uh, of the CEC series of intervention. Uh, I'm honored to have one of my dearest friends and one of the stars, uh, Egyptian stars that uh, prevailed in the field of uh, intervention abroad, Dr. Mahmoud Abdelghani, uh, cardiologist and, intervention and vascular interventionist at the University of Massachusetts, Bay State Medical Center, Springfield MA. Uh, Mahmoud will uh, talk with us uh, today about uh, a case of subclavian artery uh, stenting uh, in the setting of, uh, of Danistami. Um, he will give us a, a broad view about uh, the concepts of peripheral intervention while go with his interesting case. So Mahmoud, are you ready? Uh, yeah, hi. Hi, everybody. My name is Mahmoud Abdelghani Al Hadidi. I'm a cardiologist and vascular interventionist at University of Massachusetts Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Mass. Uh, so, um, throughout a series of lectures, we will try uh, in collaboration with the uh, Cardiology Educational Channel uh, to present some preferred cases, especially preferred cases related to um, coronary interventions. Uh, some of the most interesting cases uh, that, uh, you know, coronary interventionists might face from the preferred standpoint uh, is subclavian artery stenosis um, in uh, patients that have, that have bypass surgeries. Uh, later on, also in uh, future sessions, we will discuss some of the iliac um, diseases that we will, um, you know, discuss how you can approach uh, uh, iliac stenosis and iliac intervention, probably pre taver um, because this is, you know, usually this is the biggest um, size sheet that you will need uh, some sort of iliac intervention before. Um, so today uh, I'm going to present a case of subclavian artery stenosis uh, in a patient presented with a nice T elevation myocardial infarction. Uh, hopefully in the future we have two more interesting subclavian cases. One of them presented with a STEMI actually, uh, another one was uh, a CTO subclavian. Um, so uh, uh, today, let's start with the first um, case. Sorry. Okay, I don't have any conflict of interest. Can any, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Please oh, okay, uh, start sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, Actually, we are dazzled about your uh, background. Uh, so, you still. Um, can you see this? Can you see this screen, as uh, Heisen? No, oh, no, no, no. No, you cannot. Okay, let me try. Some... Take your time. Okay, can you see that? Okay, no. now now you're on you. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Let's that. Okay. Uh, I don't have any conflict of interest. <clears throat> so our patient is a 66-year-old uh, uh, male 
who initially presented, uh, he has a history of uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia who initially presented with urinary retention. Uh, I think when Zarek was trying to put a fully caster in, it was a difficult insertion and uh, uh, was traumatic and the patient is having chest pain Im immediately after. Um, uh, first, you know, for the first uh, minute or so, uh, they thought that the patient is having a panic attack, but he continued to uh, complain of uh, significant retrosternal chest heaviness uh, radiating to his left arm. Uh, he also started to be diaphoretic, and uh, we took a further history from him. I'm just cutting it short here. Uh, he had been complaining of dizziness and vertigo for the last year. Um, his past medical history was significant for coronary artery disease uh, with bypass surgery. Uh, about, I think in 2005, if I'm right, he had a LIMA to LAD, a RIMA to OM, an SVG to PDA and SVG to uh, second diagonal that was known to be affected by a cardiac catheterization in 2010. Uh, he also had some sort of aortic repair surgery in the past. He had history of AFib uh, on Eliquis uh, and uh, had a stroke, hypolipidemia, and he's an active smoker. Uh, on physical exam, he didn't have any uh, significant finding. And uh, we obtained an EKG. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this is his EKG, the first EKG that we obtained. Uh, as you can see, that's a, a sinus tack. Uh, he has some uh, uh, T-web inversion uh, in the lateral lead, in the anterolateral lead. Uh, there is a hint of some ST elevation in V1 and V2, but you don't see uh, significant reciprocal change. Um, we, we wonder if this is really STEMI or not. We concluded that we do not think that this is a STEMI, and we are going to repeat the uh, EKG uh, in about 15 minutes, which we did. Uh, sorry. Uh, this is the second EKG uh, that we uh, repeated. And as you can see, the patient is having significant deep T wave version in the anterolateral lead. And uh, we went backwards a year ago, and that was his EKG a year ago. So. The deep T wave inversion in the anterolateral leads are completely new. Uh, by the time we had uh, uh, blood work back, uh, most of his blood work was insignificant except for very mildly elevated troponin. And uh, our uh, lab uh, cut point is 0 0.03. So his troponin was mildly elevated at uh, 0 0.11. Uh, so at the time uh, we start, uh, at the time we give the patient uh, sublingual nitroglycerin and his chest pain completely uh, resolved. Um, we had, we, we were almost 100% sure that this is ischemic. Uh, the trigger was very weird, you know, just uh, uh, having a fully caster insertion, uh, but the patient was chest pain free at the second and uh, we decided to obtain uh, an echo uh, uh, ASAP. So we have an echo the same day within a few minutes. Uh, this is a echo finding, and I will try to uh, stop here. So I, as you can see, this is the epical for the chamber. The quality of the images are uh, uh, not good at all. You cannot see most of the walls. Uh, try to adjust our images. This is a second view, a little bit better, but you cannot see. Um, all the walls, I don't think you can judge the original wall motion abnormality uh, appropriately. And this is the first message I would like to tell, especially as a young cardiologist. Um, uh, again, I don't know the uh, availability of that uh, in Egypt specifically, but you have to use a contrast, uh, uh, like a definitive contrast, to better delineate the uh, endocardium. So you can judge the original wall motion abnormality uh, appropriately. And... Uh, uh, this is what we did. There was a hint that there is an apical uh, hypnesia, and uh, then we injected the contrast, and uh, we'll go back for a second. I will stop since I want to go slowly on that. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the echo image, the apical forward chamber view. Uh, as you can see, this whole area almost is not contracting the apex. It's uh, an uh, apical uh, inferior, apical lateral, the mid infraceptal, the mid anterolateral wall, all of this almost akinetic. It looks like a Takatsubo-like picture, which was one of our potential diagnoses for sure, but the guy has 
uh, a history of coronary artery disease. So you have to uh, think that this is ischemia until proven otherwise. Uh, here's a uh, Ecotech is showing you, uh, especially when you are using a definitive contrast to study, uh, you know exactly which view is this. So the Ecotech is telling you that this is the apical photo chamber and, and the picture is taken from here. So uh, then she switched the probe, she rotates the probe, and uh, now she's giving you the apical two chamber contrast. So again, this is the inferior wall, it's anterior wall, and again, you will see the apex is out, the apical inferior and apical anterior are out, the mid, mid distal uh, inferior wall and mid, mid to distal lateral wall are out. Uh, again, it looks like a, a I take a super picture. This is the epical three. But again, she's giving you uh, the LV, uh, LALV is in the aorta is coming out. And uh, here in this uh, view, again, you see the apex uh, is completely out. And uh, this is the image of the, uh, uh, the, cut, uh, the cut section. The anterior wall would not be contracting. Well, the it was OK. Septal wall was OK a little bit hypokinesia and uh, the lateral wall was hypokinetic. Oh, uh, was, yeah, the lateral wall, the anterior lateral wall was kinetic. So that was the echo. So I, after so this echo, you have- Mahmoud, uh, go ahead. Mahmoud, uh, sorry for interruption, but uh, can we wrap up the situation till now? We have a so, patient uh, that uh, his his um, incontinence uh, probably this is the cause of triggering the, his um, cardiac condition or the um, coronary. No, condition. I think I, I don't I don't think so. I think that was a coincidence. The guy was in pain when they were trying to put the polycaster in, and just it triggered it triggered some. The patient started having chest okay. pain at this point. You know that's why the so, scenario uh, from the beginning wasn't the best. Okay, and uh, ha having these dynamic changes in the ETG between the first and the second one, especially with um, a little bit of, um, of bradycardia in the second one with the T-wave inversion uh, is another alarming sign that uh, this patient has a, a serious coronary artery disease. I think uh, that's, so. That's definitely, that's definitely right, I agree. Uh, we know okay. that he has a uh, bad coronary artery disease. We know that he has bypasses. Last time we imaging his bypasses were 10 years ago. Uh, now we have an abnormal echo that is suggesting an LED territory, anterior, anteroceptor, anterolateral wall are out. You have myelovated troponin and you have a deep T-wave inversion in an anterior and anterolateral region. So now we are thinking about the LED or the lima, which is supplying the LED after the bypass. So we, we, okay, so, we uh, oh, go ahead. So um, till now, till this moment, what's your strategy or what's the, uh, your decision after this echo and uh, this, uh, this data, especially so, in a patient that has every, um, every risk factor in the, in the book? Sure, so we, we decided that at this point that the patient should be taken to the cath lab. Since he's just been free, we didn't rush him as, as, as we were a STEMI patient. But I think the patient was taken uh, the same day to the cath lab. Uh, I was not the interventionist that did the first, you know, the first cardiac catheterization, uh, but I was called in when they found the subclavian artery. So uh, um, uh, the interventionist took the decision to take the patient to the cath lab, uh, given the situation of pain, EKG changes, and echo abnormality. Okay. So. We decided to proceed with the uh, cardiac catheterization. And before I go with the cardiac catheterization, especially in this patient, we're gonna go and see his videos. Uh, I just wanna um, uh, point, a very important point here uh, about the axis. So uh, most of the preferred cases are being done from the femoral approach. Uh, now the radial approach is getting uh, more famous even the, in the preferred intervention. Uh, but more or less, you will definitely need to master the femoral approach. Also, uh, for coronary intervention, I would say, uh, I don't know the percentage in Egypt now, but uh, I would imagine there is a very good percentage of the interventions are still doing the procedure from 
the femoral approach, which, which is uh, absolutely uh, uh, acceptable. Uh, so mastering the axis is, ex is extremely important. Uh, first thing I wanna mention is, that, is the axis, uh, what needle do, would you use? I highly, highly recommend that you would use a micropuncture needle. Uh, I, you can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. This is a micropuncture needle. That's an 18 gauge needle. Uh, the regular needles that we use, I think it's from Cook. I mean, most of the people use in Egypt or US, uh, it's a, a 22 gauge, I believe, 22, 20 or 22 gauge. That's a, a big, a big needle to uh, access the femoral artery from the get-go. Uh, most of us did that. I did that when I was in Egypt. Um, thanks God we didn't run in trouble, but you can easily run in trouble, especially now I'm uh, working as a preferred interventionist, so the trouble come to me, you know, when, when there is a problem. So I see a lot of trouble uh, uh, with the bigger needle. You can, first you can stick, you can have a high stick. If you, if you decide to re-stick, now you have a bigger hole, a high stick, probably in the external iliac artery, a uh, chances that when, when you heparinize them, they can bleed later on. So uh, you, can, uh, uh, you, you can dissect the artery with this needle. Uh, so I highly recommend not using the regular needle and we use a micropunction needle. Uh, uh, just for the fellows, I will go very quickly with the technique. You stick with a micropunction needle, which is this one. Then you put your micropuncture wire. And this is the second hint I will, I want to talk about, this is a preferred standpoint. Uh, when you put your wire into the needle, the, the moment that the wire is coming out of the needle is the moment you want to see the wire. If the, if the wire buckle just coming out of the needle, you are probably in the process of dissecting the artery now. So you don't, wanna, you don't want to see this air buckling. This wire is a straight wire. It has kind of a floppy end, relatively floppy compared to the rest of the wire. You don't want it to buckle. You want it straight and it's going that way. Uh, so you want to see the wire once it gets out of the needle to make sure you do not dissect the common femoral artery. Then my, my um, second advice is to try to put your wire easy up to the distal aorta if you can. And basically you are testing the iliac artery with this micro, uh, with this micro uh, wire so you know how your regular wire gonna navigate. If the, if the wire goes straight, you probably are fine. If the wire takes a lot of curves, um, it, it, you probably will have some trouble. Then after the wire, you put this uh, micro caster, uh, you put the micro caster in, and then you remove the wire and the dilator from the micro caster as, uh, as one. Here, we do, a, we do a groin shot. Mo most of us do a groin shot with a micro caster. And uh, I think this is highly recommended for, for two reasons. Number one, uh, you, wanna, you wanna make sure where is your axis. If your axis is high, you have a very small uh, caster now, you have the small, a very small caster or sheath in the groin. Uh, if you think you're high, you just remove it and you hold the pressure at, the, at this point. It's better than having seven or eight French, especially if you are doing peripheral intervention, uh, seven or eight French in the groin and you remove it later on. So you take the picture with that one. If you think that you are in a big calcium chunk and I probably wouldn't dilate this calcium chunk and put a seven French sheath in, I probably would remove it. One of the keys to remove it, this, uh, one of the keys to use when you do the groin shot is to hook this the micro caster to a pressure. That, this is very important. Some people would get a syringe and inject through the microcasters. The problem is if your wire went subintimal at a point and the microcaster just pulled it and you inject, you dissect, you inject, you're gonna dissect the iliac artery, which is a, a huge deal. So you want to make sure that you have a pressure before you inject. The same thing as the coronary, the same idea. You can hook it to the uh, manual and get the pressures in, you, you, you have your injection. Um, after that, you, you think that you are in a good place uh, and your axis in a good place and the groin shot's good. Now, through the microcaster, you put your O35 wire, whatever wire you're gonna use, and over it, you put your regular sheath. So that's about the micropuncture and how important it is. Uh, uh, so, uh, one... Mahmoud, uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm terribly sorry for, uh, for interruption, but uh, sure. our, our fellows need to know um, the difference between 
uh, our regular system and the micro puncture system, it's about the caliber of the, uh, the needle and the caliber of the wire we are using. Uh, in the micro puncture system, you're using a smaller uh, needle. So the chance of uh, dissecting or perforating the artery of the, uh, on the other side is lower. You, uh, you're using a micro wire, which resembles yeah, the wire. Yeah, that's an O and A wire. Sheath. Yeah, which resembles the wire of the radial sheath. Uh, True. Uh, introduction. Yeah, uh, so it will be softer. You can feel better uh, when you, you're uh, in the subintimal space and uh, you're adding that you will need, you will need a micro catheter uh, in the uh, system of the micro puncture, which is not used regularly uh, in the regular uh, system in Egypt. Um, I don't think that uh, these are available uh, in Egypt uh, nowadays, uh, but you can, if, if you have uh, anticipated that this patient has severe peripheral vascular disease, can you uh, trick or overcome the shortage of equipment and using the radial, uh, radial equipment, radial sheath and radial uh, needle instead of the regular uh, six French uh, needle system? Um, you can do it, you well, can do it, um, instead of the micro micro uh, system uh, well you can you try to find an 18 gauge needle and definitely you, you will find a micro wire this is not uh, the problem but the problem over the micro wire now what uh, what you're gonna put you know now you got the advantage of using a smaller needle so your chances of dissecting is uh, is lower even if you perforate with the, with such a small needle, uh, or you have a higher axis, you're gonna hold the pressure, probably it's gonna heal uh, faster. Uh, but the end, you're gonna lose the advantage of having a smaller sheath and to test with it, to, to have a growing shot. So you know, where are you, you are high or low. I, the only thing I would think about that can uh, substitute that is to try to put a four French uh, in first and take a picture with a four French sheath before you have like, for example, in this subclavian case, you have to put a seven French sheath uh, because the stent doesn't go uh, with, with lower than that. So um, before you put a seven French sheath, I think it's much better to put a four French sheath and take your picture. The only question now and the only trick is the four French sheath is gonna track over the micro uh, wire or not. And there is a good possibility this might not happen. Uh, so it's, it is gonna be hit or miss. Uh, one of the things that I can tell you, if you're going to go groin, uh, especially if you're going to go over the uh, micro wire with a bigger sheath, is to make a neck in the skin. Uh, you know, don't let the sheath make the neck itself. Uh, make a neck in the skin, otherwise the wire itself is going to kink because you are not going to have much support. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Uh, uh, one there is more a thing question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one more thing. Uh, the micro wire is uh, a, a really good, or the micro puncture is really good, but it has one disadvantage. If you are not watching your wire, because this wire is so tiny, as I mentioned, it's an 018 wire, uh, it can go into the inferior bigastric artery or superficial gastric artery. And this is when they perforate the artery and can cause a retroperitoneal bleed. So you have to watch where is the wire going. The wire should go straight. If the wire starts going and make a curve down, you know you're probably in the inferior bigastric artery, and if they bleed, you probably will need to embolize them. So watching the wire going up from the iliac into the distal aorta is very important. Go ahead, I'm sorry. So, Mahmoud, uh, there is a, a question regarding uh, the use of, uh, of uh, contrast echo, and uh, this is from uh, Hagar Mustafa regarding why we injecting dye for echo assessment of full motion abnormality. I, I think you uh, explained that, but could you repeat it, uh, why you use the contrast echo uh, during uh, the echo study? Yeah, so uh, uh, if, if you cannot I, and by the way, uh, this is American College, uh, American Society of uh, Echocardiography Guidelines, American College of Cardiology Guidelines combined guidelines that was released. 
if you cannot visualize two or three walls, or uh, um, you cannot comment on them, you should use a contrast, uh, a, a contrast study. You have to inject contrast. So they basically are trying to see uh, when the contrast is in, it takes the uh, endocardium shape. So if the contrast is coming from here, but it's not coming from here, you know that this wall is hypokinetic. So basically, to see the endocardium and uh, better uh, assess the regional wall motion abnormality. That is the first and the most commonly used uh, indication for the contrast. The second most commonly used indication for the contrast is a mass. I have a mass and an LV thrombus, uh, for example, and you want to execute an LV thrombus, you can use a contrast to study and you will see a filling defect. Uh, one of the reasons, this common reason why we use it probably once a month or so, if you have a patient who is epic hookum, uh, the diagnosis of epical hookum is much, uh, much more easier using a contrast and you will see the spade shape uh, in the epical hookum. Less commonly is eosinophilic uh, carditis and these people present with obliteration of the apex completely. It looks like a, a, a mass or the apex is gone and that's extremely rare. But uh, basically to see if there is a filling defect uh, to better delineate the uh, endocardium. Very nice, and very nice explanation, Mahmoud, thank you. So sure. can we so, move on with that? Yeah, so uh, that's the first thing I want to talk about, the micropuncture uh, needle. I wanted to show you this picture uh, before I proceed, because this is a wire I used, and again, I apologize if I don't know if it's available in Egypt or not. This is an Advantage glide wire. It's called the Advantage glide wire, and it comes in 014, 018, and uh, 035 wire. The advantage glide wire is uh, basically a stiff wire from the whole wire is stiff uh, until the last 25 centimeter of the wire. It's a glide wire, you know, the, the black glide wire. So the, the distal 25 centimeter is a glide wire. That's a, a really good wire. Uh, I myself, when I went in, I used it in this patient because he had an aortic surgery. I really wanted to make sure that I'm going to go smooth up from his LEX, which I'm going to show you as some tortuosity and up. So basically this wire would navigate, the 35 centimeter will navigate its way up. Then after the, fir the first 25 centimeter, you have a stiff wire. So now you can do your procedure over this stiff wire. You don't have to change. If you don't have this wire, you have to do two steps basically. Uh, you have to use a glide wire, a regular glide wire, the one that we all use. Um, you can use this one to navigate your way up to the, up to the aorta over this wire, if you have a long one, you have to have a long one or short caster. Over this wire, you put a caster in. You can put a JR, you can put a glide caster, you can put any caster. You put it over the glide wire, then you pull your glide wire out and you put your regular J wire and use it as your guide wire now. So using so a you, glide we have, wire. <laughs> we have um, uh, in Egypt, the available is the uh, Teromo uh, stiff wires. It has the same uh, um, the same uh, um, specs idea. that you uh, that okay. and the same idea. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, a floppy hydrophilic uh, floppy wire in the tip and a stiff shaft, uh, and it comes with uh, a, a two seventy centimeter long, so you can exchange uh, whatever you want uh, uh, on it. Yeah, I that's think excellent. It that's exactly what I'm. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a VersiCore actually... wire, the same thing also. Uh, it has, a, I, I, I don't know, VersiCore has the same thing. So what I'm trying to say, use a glide. If you have a, a hard time with the iliac artery ten, to navigate from the iliac up to the distal aorta, you have to use some sort of a floppy wire there. You just don't go with the J wire blindly and you push, you know, that, that yeah. so you the might not be able to is, cross. Do not, do not push. If you have resistance, no, never. change your gear to uh, to another glide wire in order to um, uh, make it make it easier. So uh, go uh, go on with the case. Okay. So so uh, let's see the diagnostic cast now. Sorry. Here is uh, the diagnostic. Cast. I don't know if you can see it. This is a drawing shot. We can, we can see it, yes. Okay, yeah, so yeah. this is yeah. a, this, 
this is a plastic cast, as I mentioned, my colleague uh, took the patient to the cast lab, so he did this procedure. And uh, uh, this is a technique I was just talking about. Now he put, uh, what you see here is a micro a caster, the, a very, very small caster. How small is this? Then he took the, he put the axis in, then he took um, a picture with a micro caster. He used a syringe here, but he probably connected it to a pressure before he injected. So now he confirming a good axis. Now he can upgrade uh, his sheath to a five French, six French, seven French, whatever he wants to use. So um, I just have to move from here. <clears throat> so uh, as I mentioned, he had a hard time to navigate first with the J wire. He tried to go with the J wire with the usual approach because he didn't know how tortuous is the iliac artery. He tried to go with the J wire. Then he had difficulty pushing the J wire with resistance. At the time, he stopped and he decided to take a higher pair to see what's going on. And as you can see here, the, uh, uh, the iliac artery has some tortuosity. And now he understands there is some tortuosity, some stenosis, and he is navigating against that. He was able to- interesting question, Mahmoud. Um, why we did not choose uh, the, radial, the left radial axis uh, for this patient? Uh, especially we are, we are expecting tortuosity and health in the femoral axis. So well, we, why, why we did not we choose the radial? We did not expect that uh, tortuosity. He didn't know. You know, he expected that the patient would have some peripheral vascular disease. Uh, but here, generally speaking, if you have a patient who is bypass, your approach is a left radial or the groin almost 50-50. I think he felt more comfortable to just go to the groin from the get-go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, this is a, a cardiac catheterization. And, and uh, as you guys can see, uh, he has a severe native disease. His distal uh, left main has, I don't, I don't know, I would say 20% is LED. His LCX is gone uh, shortly after the origin. Uh, uh, and uh, as the LED also uh, has a very significant uh, disease. And as you can see, this picture shows you the LED, the septal uh, artery, and the LED is shortly gone. That's not a big surprise for us. We know that the patient has bypass. This is a native right coronary artery, a CTO. <clears throat> the patient had a REMA uh, to OM branch, and this is the REMA. Uh, the REMA is white patent. Uh, uh, he had an SVG this to is, this the- is, This is the REMA or an HV, uh, SVG? I think that's a REMA. Uh, I think that's a free I REMA, I believe. I it's hard to tell. SVG. From the axis? Probably, it's a, a vein graft, I cannot see ectasia, probably it, it might be an SVG, but the, his history yeah. said a, a REMA to the, uh, to the OM. Uh, either way, that's a, a vein graft to the OM, it's a, a patent graft, that's not his problem here. That's probably a graft okay. to the PDA, it's gone, that's new compared to 2010, 10 years ago, but looks like it's gone for a long time, this is not the culprit and does not fit um, the distribution of the echo or anything like that. So, and we know that he had uh, the SVG to diagonal is included 10 years ago, so we didn't try to uh, find it. Uh, so my colleague now is uh, uh, going after the Lima because he, he expected that this is a culprit for the patient. Uh, he's trying to get from the arch into uh, the subclavian artery and he's having a very hard to get in. Uh, he tried to take a picture of the arch to see where is the ostium, and this is what he's getting. He's not getting a very, oh. uh, um, very optimum pictures. Uh, I think this picture is going to be better, and I'm going to stop here, and I'll try to explain it to you. Um, let's see here if I can stop it here. So basically, he's knowing that uh, now we know that this is a complicated anatomy. We know that this is not an easy uh, case. First of all, you have arch calcification. It looks really bad, arch calcification. Uh, you have, we know that this is the right subclavian problem. Uh, sorry, the right brachycephalic artery to give the right subclavian and the right carotid artery, uh, common carotid artery. 
We know that this is an artery. We don't know if this is the lift, uh, common carotid or the lift subclavian. We cannot know, but he tried to take a JR caster and try to get in and he couldn't by all means. And he concluded that the patient probably has significant subclavian artery stenosis. At the time, I was called to the cast lab uh, for, the right, for the left subclavian or, or possible left subclavian artery stenosis. Um, so I saw this image, I couldn't swear the picture were suboptimal. Uh, what I would do different, I probably would put the pigtail down a little bit, uh, give a higher, um, you know, a bigger amount of uh, contrast, probably uh, 40 cc of contrast over two seconds. So 20 cc a second for two seconds, for a total of two seconds, at least, um, 1,000 uh, PSI, uh, you would have a better op opacification of the uh, image. Um, uh, but that was a little, a little bit suboptimal picture, but we concluded that there is probably a subclavian artery stenosis. And we know from this anatomy, from this connection, that that's not the normal anatomy we are looking after. At this point, I offered it to Scrubbin immediately trying to open the subclavian artery, and there was another opinion from one of our seniors, the cath lab director, to stop at this point. The patient was chest pain free, trying to get a scan uh, of the uh, aorta and uh, the great vessels. That's what it's called the CT scan of the aortic arch with great vessels to visualize what's going on, to know the anatomy. Uh, that's not a, no, a usual anatomy to know where is the subclavian is coming from. Um, and, and this is what we did. So, let me close and go back. And that's his CT scan, as you can see. I don't know if you can see it or not. So the CT scan, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I just took two images. You can see here the calcification. How bad is the calcification? You can see this chunk of calcium, and this is the osseum of the left subclavian artery. It's almost 100% occlusion, close to, it's not 100, but close to 100%. Let's say it's 90 plus percent easy and this chunk of calcium. Okay, so we know that we are uh, dealing with a calcified lesion. Uh, it, it will be very challenging. Interestingly, they couldn't tell us on the CT angio or we, we ourselves when we looked at it, we couldn't tell exactly where is the ostium. Uh, the origin of the brachycephalic and the carotids lift subclavian from the arch was very unusual and uh, um, when I when I did my procedures the next day I will show you uh, the images uh, that we took you guys are following me yes we're following there okay, is uh, another question yes, Mahmoud, yes Mahmoud, go on please okay so uh, uh, we as I, as I mentioned, we took the patient off the table. We did a CT scan the same day. We got the CT. We know that now it's a 95 plus occlusion, heavily calcified. They told us the anatomy is not normal, but they couldn't tell us exactly. So the question, the big question was, uh, let, let me tell you the anatomy. The normal anatomy is only, then I tell you the abnormality. In the normal anatomy, if this is the arch, first the brachycephalic comes out to give you the right. Uh, common uh, carotid artery and the right subclavian. Then beside it, it comes the left common carotid artery. Then beside it comes the left subclavian artery uh, separately. Each of them are with the separate ostium. Uh, the questions that we didn't know if the three of them are coming with a common origin or not, or two of them are coming with a common origin and one is separate, which is not uncommon. That is a bovine arch. We know that uh, he had... Uh, uh, he didn't have a bovine arch completely. He had something more rare than a bovine arch. I will explain it. But he did. Ha they they could tell us that at least the sub the brachycephalic and uh, the left carotid artery are coming with a common origin, but not tell for sure if the subclavian is coming with the, with them in the origin or not. Uh, but I think it was a separate origin. <clears throat> so. Uh, I took the patient the next day. Now I know what I'm dealing with. I, I took the patient next day to do the subclavian uh, intervention. Uh, before I go in, there are some difference. Now we are going to talk about preferred intervention. Now there are some difference. I want you to understand the equipment. So I'm going to go in depth with the equipment, uh, but I want you to understand the difference of the equipment. Number one, in the preferred inter intervention, we use a long sheath. 
We don't use the short sheath that we usually use in anything in the radial or the groin. In the peripheral, we use a long sheath. There is a 45, 65, and 90 sheath. There is a bigger one if you want to reach from the radial down to the knee. That's a, a, a newer one. Uh, but usually 45, 65, and 90. And for the subclavian, in general, we use, seven, six, uh, we use 65 uh, centimeter long sheath. This is called a destination sheath. Um, this is the sheath I used, except for the, the one I used was uh, straight. It was not curved like that. The curved one, we use it for the renal stenting uh, because it gives you a better support. But for uh, the prefer whether the leg or the subclavians, we, we usually use a straight one, but I couldn't find a good picture for the straight one. But this is the one we use. That's a sheath dilator inside and outside. The casters that we use to engage the subclavian, usually a JR4 caster, a regular caster we use. There's a caster called a VTK caster. Uh, the VTK caster is this caster, as you can see. Basically, the, this end rests on the posterior wall of the aortic arch, so it gives you support. So when you pass your wire that way, when you are going in, when it push you back, you have the support from the posterior wall of the aorta, aortic arch. So that's a VTK caster. You usually use it to engage the uh, brachycephalic, the carotids, or the left subclavian artery. The glide caster, I use it in the middle of the case. That's why I wrote it here. The wires that uh, I used in this case, or usually being used, I didn't use all of that, is the Fielder XT wire, that's an four wire, Fielder FC wire. I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with that. That's a coronary wire too, using the CTO. There is an M wire by Tirome. It's a very good wire. It's a preferred wire, 018 wire. And uh, there are working wires. Working wires are stiffer, so you have some support. You put a balloon over, you put a stint over, it gives you some support. The fielders and the M wires are that supportive. Uh, the working wires are mainly the V14 or V18. V14 because it's 014, V18 it's 018. And the nitrix wire, the nitrix wire by Medtronic. Uh, either the nitrix or the V wire, both of them are working wires are very good. The balloons that you use, of course, is a bigger diameter, bigger lens for the peripheral, uh, usually in the subclavian. The subclavian arch diameter usually range between six to nine millimeter. So when you want to predilate, especially when you have so, that much calcium, you don't want to predilate to six or eight. That's too much. And I'm going to tell you why not to do that in the beginning. We can post dilate, but don't do that in the beginning. So I probably use up to five millimeters for predilatation. I think in this case, I tried to take it uh, slower and light. I started with a, a four millimeter balloon. Then I upgraded it to millimeter balloon to nominal. One of the uh, other balloons that you can use is the chocolate. I will come back to the shockwave. The chocolate balloon is a balloon done by my, uh, made by Medtronic. It's a really good balloon, a balloon that has a um, kind of metal uh, struts on, on top of the balloon. So kind of the angioscult, if you would think about it, but it's not the same as angioscult. Angioscult is meant to cut the calcium. The chocolate balloon is not. The chocolate balloon is meant to, where, when the balloon dilates, it dilates equally. So it's not like one area dilates, one area doesn't dilate. Uh, it's done by, uh, as, I, as I said, it's made by Medtronic. Then you can use the shockwave balloon. The shockwave balloon, um, we, we'll discuss that later on in another session. Uh, it's an off-label use to, to use the shockwave balloon in the uh, subclavian artery, it's approved for the renal and approved for the iliac down to below the knee. All of these are approved by Disturb uh, PAD trial. Uh, currently, uh, the Disturb CAD trial, the coronary trial, um, I think they just finished recruiting, if I'm not wrong, in the United States, but the Disturb uh, CAD trial 2 uh, uh, was completed in Europe, uh, I would say a year or two years ago. Uh, so the Disturb 3 now in the United States, and I believe there is a Disturb 4 uh, in Japan uh, going on now. So uh, <clears throat> we, we can discuss later on in another session how the shockwave works uh, and uh, what is the benefit of it. Um, for the stent, as I mentioned, usually you're going to go between 6 to 9 millimeter in diameter. Uh, I highly recommend that you use a balloon expandable covered stent. If 
you will place your stent away from the ostium of the vertebral artery and the lima. But if you think that your disease is including or probably you're going to um, end up covering the ostium of the lima uh, or the vertebral artery, I would highly recommend that you use a balloon expandable non-covered stent. But if you are away, it's highly recommended that you use a covered stent. And this is why I was saying um, do not predilate to the nominal first. We will come now and I'll show you why uh, not to do that. So, okay. In, so, if you have summary, any questions? Uh, in summary, you, Mahmoud, uh, you will have uh, stiff wires uh, and escalating from the 0.014 inch wire uh, coronary stiff wires uh, to your conventional uh, 0.018 uh, wires, uh, dilation uh, with the balloons, and uh, choosing stents, I'm trying to summarize for uh, all our. Uh, no, I, I'm gonna, I'm I'm gonna discuss that now because in this case the wi the wire went, but nothing tracked, so I had to do to do another yeah. trick here. So uh, uh, there, is a, there is a very important question. Sure. A very important question. Um, you are intervening now with no, I, uh, uh -huh. with with uh, the ostium of the subclavian artery, and you have. Sure doubts and images showing a severe stenosis in the ostium of the uh, left carotid artery. So um, what's your plan in order to protect the ostium of the left carotid artery? Well, we the, the images that we have, we are not sure where is the left carotid ostium because at, at this until this point when Kevin took the pictures, we weren't sure this artery that we, we, we know that the artery going up there is a brachycephalic tree. We didn't know what is the artery there because the, the cut was low. We didn't go high. So I don't know if this is the uh, carotid artery is going up or that was the uh, left subclavian artery. I think I'm going to answer more of the questions you have in this. The left carotid artery was not compromised in, in this case. Okay. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, may so, I so, ask you uh, uh, sure. a couple of questions, please, before sure. you go through uh, this very interesting case. Um, sure. uh, the CT uh, actually uh, uh, sh should give us uh, more data uh, uh, regarding the, this uh, um, uh, subclavian, ghost subclavian. Uh, actually, uh, we couldn't see uh, the uh, left subclavian, uh, probably. Uh, also, uh, it may uh, determine either we can go left radial or not, uh, especially uh, if we only have six French uh, uh, radial uh, sets, as we have here in Egypt. Uh, uh, it's extremely rare to uh, find seven French uh, radial. So uh, uh, the CT uh, gives us more data regarding this subclavian, regarding the diameter of uh, uh, this uh, subclavian. Uh, if it is uh, seven or more uh, or eight or nine millimeters uh, versus seven or less uh, uh, in diameter, so we can go with the six French radial, left radial. Uh, also, uh, we couldn't see the uh, the the ossium probably of uh, left subclavian. So uh, left radial will be more uh, reliable. What do you think regarding the, uh, these points of uh, access? Well, the CT, as you said, the CT is extremely helpful and uh, uh, and that was a good decision to stop and uh, get a CT scan before we go so we know what we are dealing with. Again, we are dealing with the STEMI here, so we are more relaxed. The patient is chest pain free. His EKG looks ugly, but we still have time. So the CT told us a few things that are very important. First of all, the diameter, as you mentioned, the length is, how bad is it? I can't remember exactly in the report. But we, we get to know the lens. It told us that the anatomy is not normal. That's one thing. The other thing from the previous images, I just didn't want to go in depth. The arch has types. There is something called type one, two, three arch. And according, if you go higher in the number, the, uh, if this is the arch like that, the uh, origin of the arch, uh, the preferred vessels will come close to the ascending, which is going to make it very difficult to engage either from, uh, especially from the femoral approach. Uh, but if I would go from the uh, radial, what, what, I, why I didn't do that? Number one, I need a seven French cheese, and it has to be a seven for one. I'm going to put a cover distance. 
There are multiples. There is an iCast, live stream, Vioband. Some of them can go through six and rarely go through six, but at least maybe seven French. I use the Vioband that has to go to through the seven French. As a matter of fact, I think if you go to nine millimeter, you have to put an eight French, and you, you are not going to do that in the radial yes. artery, I would guess. You yes. wouldn't prefer to do that. So your other option is to do brachial, which we all the time do. But the problem is if the brachial bleed, you are in a big trouble and it can bleed. I mean, yes. I did a lot of procedure from the brachial, but it can be a nightmare. So if you can try to avoid the brachial, try to avoid the brachial. It's the second thing. The third thing is if you are coming from the radial artery, you're going to put your wire most likely, especially in this situation, you're going to put it in the ascending aorta, which I did not want to do because for you to go up and take the turn to go into the descending aorta is going to be very difficult. Yes, so I didn't want to put the wire in the ascending aorta. That's why I decided to go from the femoral, from, from the femoral approach. Although I, I'm not saying that this is the right decision. As a matter of fact, my colleague uh, during this, the next day, he did uh, suggest we go radial. But, you know, it, it's kind of you are the operator, what you feel comfortable with. And I, I didn't think that this is a, the best idea, or at least for me, I didn't feel comfortable with that. Okay, great. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm dazzled with this expert discussion, but uh, I think we are giving our colleagues a hard time following uh, the, the, the okay. this sophisticated discussion. So we can on. move on. Okay, let's go on. Okay. So that's what I'm putting now is the Advantage Glide Wire and O35 wire. Uh, so as you can see now, I put the wire into the distal uh, in the descending aorta, and I'm following this now. You know, it's very important. You know, you don't push blindly, especially. You, I know from the previous day that there is tortuosity in the iliac artery. I know that this patient had an aort an aortic surgery. So for sure, I want to see the tip of my uh, she's until it goes up, and this is the picture I was just documenting. Uh, that <clears throat> now I uh, uh, I start taking pictures now, and uh, the arch. First of all, for the peripheral, we take pictures with DSA. Uh, it's a digital subtraction and geography, yeah. and uh, just for for the sake of when you see the next image is the DSA, so you know what's the what what is this digital and geography, what happens is basically the machine takes a picture, which is a still picture, and memorize it. And then when you inject, it subtracts the original image from what you are in, or what's in new. And it shows you what's in new only, okay? So what you see at the end is only the contrast and you don't see anything else because the, uh, the machine subtracted the original image. Uh, this should have been a, a DSA picture, but for some reason they didn't set up the machine as a DSA. Uh, so I took a regular, uh, sorry, I took a regular image, and that's okay. I just want to stop here and show you uh, what's going on origin. here. It's a common origin. It, uh, I, at least now it's not only the common origin. I think at least uh, we know that now the brachialic artery, which is here. Uh, brachiocephalic giving the uh, right uh, subtin artery and right carotid artery yeah. and the uh, carotid tree are coming at least from a common origin, which which makes it a bovine arch. This is the definition yes. of bovine arch. The left carotid comes with as a, a brachiocephalic. But I think it's not only a bovine arch, it's a subsection of bovine arch. It's called the truncus bicorticus. The bovarch, both of them come down to come from a single origin. I do not think this is the situation. I think the left carotid artery is coming from the brachiocephalic artery itself, not with an origin. So it's coming from the middle. As you see, I yes, think it's, it's I think so. It's a big Yeah. So uh, in this image, I could not tell where the left subclavian are coming from. Until now, I cannot. Uh, this is the images that usually shows you, but again, because of the abnormal anatomy, I couldn't tell for sure. And this is a still image that I, I, I took. So uh, again, I, I know that I'm repeating, but just for the, the right subclavian, right carotid, left carotid, and there is a hint here of the left subclavian artery. So I tried to, this is a DSA, as you can see. So it's subtracting what's behind, and now you can see much better, okay? So, uh, that's another view 
um, again, I cannot tell wh what's coming from what. Now we know there is a common origin for something here or something coming from the from the brachiocephalic artery. But again, the left carotid and the left subclavian are overlapping here, so you cannot tell. So I took multiple angles to take images, and again, I could not tell where is the origin. So I decided to fish for it. So I decided to put the caster in and just try to engage kind of blindly. And as you can see, this is a JR caster. Let me stop here and tell you what is, uh, where are we now. So this is a sheath. As you can see, it's a long sheath. That's a gold tip, okay? That is the end of these. And the sheath now is working as a support caster for you. Inside the sheath, there is a JR caster it's coming here. And the JR caster is gonna be looking this way you torque it up, you turn it like that, and you start fishing for the artery. And you fish for something and it's not it, try to turn it a little bit, pull it back, then put again, and et cetera, et cetera. That's how you try to engage the subclavian, sorry, the subclavians are uh, carotid. So you will see here the casters we are trying to here. Now I'm trying to engage. So I'm torquing it, and I will give it a test. And this test is going to the right brachiocephalic artery, as you can see. So I turn it again, then retorque it again. Again, it's minimal movement you are seeing now because they are having the, uh, a common origin. So you don't have to move a lot. Um, so that's, uh, that's when we engage the brachiocephalic artery. So I try to get the subclavian. That's the second image I got. That's actually the left carotid artery, as you can see. So far, we cannot find the subclavian artery. So I'm gonna pull it back a hair more. And we were able to get into the subclavian artery. And this is the image. You can see how critical is this disease. I have to know, you have to understand a lot about this picture not to run in trouble. Number one, that's an extremely calcified arch. What's the importance of that? This is the arch in dissect. You know, you really want to be gentle with that. The whole thing is calcium. And if you have a tear or dissection there, it's gonna go fast, okay? So the second thing you can see in this area is the ostium. The ostium is, uh, it was measured in the uh, CT scan to be between 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 centimeter. You are talking about a milli or uh, one to two millimeters. So hardly ever you can even see uh, an ostium here. Uh, I'm gonna try to run it few times. Okay, so that's the ostium. Now, <clears throat> uh, I decided to proceed with the intervention and I chose to with the fielder XT wire 300 cm, 300 centimeter. And uh, I was able to navigate the fielder XT wire uh, through uh, this lesion. I put it uh, up and distal into the arm. So, you know, I give myself support because the more you have distally, the more support you have uh, from the wire. So <clears throat> there, is, there are like two steps that are not imaged here. I will show you that this is when I was trying to put the wire in, uh, uh, having a test and navigate my wire. Uh, I freeze an image to know my reference and let's stop here. So this is the wire here. You can see the wire here. So I was able to cross and I put the wire in. <clears throat> Not imaged here, after I put the fielder wire, I took a glide caster, an O35 glide caster. I decided to put it over this wire to, tr to track the wire and put it distally in the arm. Then I pull the O14 wire and I put the O35 wire, um, maybe an amplets, amplets step or something like that, to put it and work over that. The problem is the glide caster, which is the, the caster that tracks the most, would not track the wire. And it would kick me out. Every time I tried to go in, it would kick me out. So I did a trick here. I used a body wire, an 014 wire. I think I used the run wire as a body wire. And I put it uh, beside the fielder up and I crossed it. And this is the second wire you can see here. So that's the second wire. This is the first wire, okay? And over two wires, I put the glide caster, an O35 uh, caster that is here. You can see the shadow here ends here. So I was able to track the O35 glide caster over two O14 wires um, 
once the once the uh, 035 caster is beyond the area of interest, now you can pull out your 014 wires and you put an 035 wire. Again, the 035, the regular 035 ambulance is not going to track, will not track. You hardly ever had trackability with the glide caster. It will not. So again, I use the advantage glide wire. I tried to use some sort of glide wire to to navigate through this curve to go up and around. And uh, I was able, I think this is the image here. Sorry. Here, so that's what you're gonna see. I'm pulling back now the 014 wires. Now you have the casters here. The, the caster is gonna be left behind, okay? Now you have a caster, an 035 caster beyond the area of blockage. You should be able to navigate a glide wire or an advantage glide so you have uh, a stiff back you can work on. And this is what I did. And this is an 035 wire, <clears throat> uh, an advantage glide wire. If you can see, this is a balloon. Uh, one end is the other end. You can notice another dot here. This dot is on top of the wire itself. And this is a transition between the stiff and the glide part of the advantage glide wire. So you can imagine, I would love to put this wire more distally so I have more support by the stiff part, but I was not able to navigate furthermore with this. So I just hardly on the stiff part of the wire uh, putting my balloon. And you can see the balloon here. <clears throat> That's after the first balloon, I believe. This is the second balloon, a five millimeter balloon. We, I think we even took it to... Uh, uh, above nominal. <clears throat> and this is the image uh, and two dilatation with a 4O and 5O uh, balloon. So now you have a bird lumen. Now you can see the lima is filling. But again, the lumen is not adequate by all means, OK? So at this point, I will come back. I, I can't remember it was Haysam or somebody else who asked. Uh, about the ballooning and the stint. Now you have a lumen past the stint. The cover the stint are a little bit bulky. The value band has a very good tra uh, trackability. Life stream is good too, uh, but it's bulky. You have to have an, you know, a lumen for the, for the stint to pass. And we have never had any lumen before. And now you have a lumen. Now I would put the stint. And the reason for that, if you go, if you decide to go with an eight or I think that by CAT scanning, the diameter was measured to be eight. If you decided to go uh, uh, by eight balloon, you might push with the balloon against the calcium and you dissect the subcleaving and you dissect the aorta. Does the stent make any difference? Yes, it does. Yes, you will inflate it to nominal, but especially if it's a covered stent, it works as a graft. So even if you dissect, hopefully the dissection is not going to uh, extend beyond the stent that much. So you have a scaffold to stop the dissection, kind of. So what you are trying to gain in the beginning, you are trying to gain a lumen through which you can pass your stent, which we did here by a 5-0 balloon. Now, I think we have enough lumen to put the stent in. And this is a still image I was using as a reference for self. But, and, and this is our stent here. Again, the sheath is as close as it can be, and you have the stent here, and this is a cover, the vinyl band covered the stent by gore. Uh, as I mentioned, I think the diameter was measured to eight millimeter. I did use a seven millimeter stent, and I did it to undersize, then both dilate if needed, it's better than oversize in this place. Uh, the good thing about the uh, covered stents, uh, you can both dilate them a lot. So if I'm not mistaken, the seven millimeter of uh, value band can be post dilated up to 11 millimeter. So you, are get, you put seven, you get 11 millimeter. Great, great results with uh, the cover distance. <clears throat> Here is the key uh, in the subclavian artery. You have to get, if the ostium is involved, you have to put about two, two-ish millimeter into the arch. So the distal 
end of the stent should be into the arch. You cannot just stop or flush at the, uh, the arch. You have to put uh, into the arch to secure the ostium and make sure that the ostium is going to be white patent, which you see here, placement of the stent. Sorry, a second. And this is the second image here. <clears throat> I think I was uh, testing here. And that's the inflation of the stent. And as you can see, you can even tell where is the arch from the calcium. This is the arch here. We are about two to three millimeter into the arch. And that's the inflation of the stent. This is post stenting picture. Much better flow, as you can see. Everything is preserved. You have the vertebral artery here. It's uh, intact. And you have the lima here. You guys can hear me? Yes, yeah, we, we can. can hear you clearly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And you, you have the lima here. By the way, we knew the day before when we did the CT scan that the lima was patent from the CT angel. And we know that the culprit is a subclavian. So we didn't have to go after the lima after that because we knew that it was uh, patent. But uh, anyway, I think we took a few pictures. So I will show you. And this is another view of the subclavian. And you can see it's wide patent, and you can see here, gonna come down here the lima, and you can see that. There's an important question, okay. Mahmoud, uh, about the foreshortening of the stent. We know that the peripheral stents uh, uh, do tend to foreshorten. So uh, that's there's absolutely no difference between between the covered stent and the bare uh, bare metal stents. Uh, yeah, the covered uh, stent in the tend issue to... of foreshortening. Yeah, the covered stent tend to foreshorten more uh, than the other stent. That's number one, except for those stents that we use for the venous disease, it's foreshorten a lot. But other than the wall stent, uh, usually the covered stent foreshorten more. Usually they do not foreshorten unless you post dilate them. And sometimes we use that as a trick. For example, if we put a covered stent and we think we are just at the ostium of the vertebral artery, for example, and you want to pull it back a, a millimeter, of course you cannot pull it back. What you can do is try to post by, you know, as safe as you can, uh, um, take it to a higher pressure, it will sh foreshorten. I think uh, it foreshorten about one millimeter from each, uh, from each side if you go above nominal certain number. So it doesn't foreshorten a lot, it foreshorten about one millimeter. And sometimes we use the foreshortening as a trick. Uh, if we, uh, if we uh, compromise the flow in the side branch. So uh, this is a seven millimeter, as I, as I said, I think it was measured at 1.8 millimeter or 7.8. So that was the image we were going to both dilate. I put the sheath beyond the stent, the subclavian artery and the iliac artery. Both of them, they go with the pressure difference they do not go that much with the percentage of the blockage. If you have a pressure difference before and after the block 20 millimeter mercury, that's a significant uh, blockage. It's something like FFR if you want to call it, you know? So I did put uh, the dilator in, and this is very important for the fellow. You will never, you will never push the sheath like that without a dilator in front of it. You can push with a balloon, you can put half of the balloon inside the sheath and, and push together so the balloon works as a dilator uh, or you put the dilator, it's safer. So I put the, dil I put the dilator and then I put it beyond the stent and I pulled the bag. There was no gradient whatsoever at this time. Uh, I, I think I decided I did not even post dilator. I think uh, we had good results and this is another image now. We decided to take an image for the uh, uh, for the lima, just to uh, document its patency. Um, and that's the groin image. I, I, I tend sometimes to do uh, the groin image at the end, uh, just to, uh, before I close, uh, although it's better to uh, do it in the beginning. So uh, basically, this is what we did here. One thing I want to also mention about the cover distance, uh, it used to be much more years ago. The cover stent years ago, I don't want to mention the company, uh, the first company that made the cover stent used to dislodge and fall of the balloon. So they came with the idea and it's 
a tradition that you always unsheath the covered stem. So you go with the sheath beyond the lesion and you put your stent inside the sheath, then you pull your sheath back, you unsheath the stent. Because if you push your stent across the lesion, you might dislodge it. It's less likely now with the newer stents, the Vioban and the Life Stream, yet it had been reported multiple times with every single company. So it's not a bad idea to, uh, to make it a habit to unsheath the covered stent. That's one thing. Uh, in my situation here, I not unsheath it because I didn't want to go with the dilator across this critical lesion. And I wasn't sure, you know, if I will have the support from the wire. And as I mentioned, I did not have a, a, a bigger uh, wire purchase there to be able to put my uh, sheet uh, distally. So I did not unsheath that stent, although, as I mentioned, it's highly recommended that you do unsheath stent. So let me go back, and uh, I think we have a few slides left. Any questions about the procedure before we uh, proceed? Yes, actually, oh, yes. Uh, uh, it is a very uh, uh, marvelous uh, case, actually. Um, I want to ask you about the self-expandable uh, 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 stents. Uh, if you have both stents on shelf, uh, both uh, sizes uh, at your hand, uh, which one you uh, would choose, um, especially um, uh, 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 about the uh, uh, outcomes um, uh, later on, uh, the restenosis or uh, the uh, the uh, post dilatation. Uh, what do you prefer uh, if you would choose one? So, generally speaking, if you want to uh, get an ostium of a bigger artery like that, you usually use a balloon expandable stent. I do have both of them on the shelf, and we hardly ever use a self-expandable stent as a subclavian artery. Some people do, but you know, where I was trained or the way I was trained that we always use, especially if it's involving the ostium, we always use a balloon expandable stent in the ostium of the subclavian artery and also in the ostium of the common ilia coming out of the aorta. If you are going to use a stent there, you use a balloon expandable stent. Uh, for example, in the external iliac artery, just after the common iliac, the internal iliac artery, and continue as an external iliac artery, the same continuation of the common iliac, you can use a, a self-expandable stent. They work absolutely fine. Uh, but again, if you, uh, you want to get an ostium of a large artery, I think you will need to have a balloon expandable, either a covered or non-covered stent. Thank but you. did I see did uh, I see that a, happening? Yes, uh, I mean yeah. people use a balloon or self expandable. Uh, there is another question about the access site. Do we need a device closure for the access site, or it's just like our regular intervention, especially that we have a, a hip replacement? Uh, so does it matter if we have a hip replacement uh, to use a dedicated closure device for the access site? Uh, or no, just, no. Uh, just uh, a regular compression like we uh, usually do? Well, I, I don't know about the availability of the, the closure device in Egypt, to be honest with you. But uh, no, for the sake of just because of its hip replacement, that it makes hardly ever no difference. Um, the access side, I will tell you, if, I ha if you have a high access, let's say that you realize that late, for example, uh, First of all, if you have any weird axis, whatever it is, you, are, you, hit your, you hit a calcium, you have a high axis, you hit the bifurcation of the comma femur into superficial and profunda femurs. If you have any weird axis, you hold the pressure, period. Holding pressure is the safest out of all of them. The only okay. probably exception I would give is uh, if you have a really high axis, that you think you are not going to have compressibility again. If you are away from the femoral head, you are away from the iliac, I think not a bad idea to pair close it, then hold the pressure for at least 20 minutes. Okay. And I... what's your strategy about the doing anti therapy in this patient? Um, generally, uh, can we, we split the question? Uh, in this patient yeah. in particular, What's your regimen mm -hmm. in uh, doing antiplatelet therapy? And usually, 
what do you use as antiplatelets in patients with peripheral intervention or uh, subclavian uh, artery disease? This patient well, has uh, AF uh, mm -hmm. and uh, he had an acute coronary syndrome. So what's your strategy and what is your strategy in general? So I, this patient was very interesting. As a matter of fact, we finished this procedure and the patient was in the hospital for the next two weeks because of hematuria. So uh, in a normal situation, in a normal situation, uh, first of all, guideline-wise, there is no clear guidelines for the preferred, generally speaking, subclavian or leg, for what kind of antiplatelet you use and for how long do you use it. It's very vague, and most of, of, most of what we do uh, is coming uh, from the coronary interventions. So in a normal situation, what I do and what most of the preferred interventions do um, is dual antiplatelet therapy with either whatever you would like, aspirin plavix, aspirin brillinta, uh, for at least a month, uh, preferred for three months. And if the patient is young and there is no uh, bleeding issues, I probably would continue that for a year. But we know that after a month, remember, we, we are talking about seven, eight millimeter artery, easy. So the chances of thrombosis is not super high uh, there. So I would do uh, uh, at least a month and uh, uh, prefer the for three months, what I would do. Um, in this patient, uh, he had AFib and he was an eloquist. So uh, what I did is I put the patient on eloquist and uh, pedogrel only uh, and uh, we dropped the aspirin. The problem is the next day, uh, once we started the Plavix, uh, he started having hematuria from what, if you remember, the traumatic uh, folic castor and it become frank hematuria. It was really bad. His hemoglobin dropped to five and it was a bad situation to the point that we had to stop the eloquence and the plavix two days after the procedure and we had to stop it for two weeks and thanks God nothing happened to him. So uh, in, a, in a normal situation, aspirin plavix, uh, in a uh, triple, I would avoid triple therapy and I would do uh, probably eloquence and plavix or cumulin and plavix. Okay. So there is one thing that uh, I want to um, explain here, which is extremely important the subclavian steel syndrome, and hopefully, uh, um, the young fellows that are listening to us remember that. And uh, it, it will have a big element in the next case or in the future case, the STEMI patient. Uh, the uh, physiology was similar to that. So to explain here, uh, this is the arch uh, and uh, in a normal situation, that's uh, the brachiocephalic gives us the right uh, sub, uh, subclavian artery. And uh, uh, that's the tibral artery coming from the right subclavian artery, gives us the right carotid then the arch gives the left carotid, and this is a left subclavian artery, and out of the left subclavian artery comes a vertebral artery. In a normal situation, what happens is the blood moves from the arch to the subclavian, to the vertebral here, then from subclavian to the vertebral here, to be basilic artery, and go to the brain stem, and that's the normal situation. When you have a subclavian artery stenosis here, uh, the pressure here is so low, and what happens is uh, subclavian steel syndrome. So I'm sorry, I apologize. Yeah. So the blood would move from here up to the right subclavian artery. It goes to the brain, to the basilar artery. Then the arm starts to steal the blood from the brain. And the blood flow would go backward from the vertebral artery, retro retrograde flow in the vertebral artery. You can easily see that with the ultrasound and it goes back to the left arm, as, as you can see. And that's and why this, people this feel dizzy and lightheaded vertigo. Yeah. Okay. And that's why that guy had dizziness for a year that was not diagnosed and, and probably was overseen. So that's a subclavian so, a steel in summary. Right. In summary? So, in, we, in, we uh, have, so I have yeah. two slides of the learning points here. The subclavian artery stenosis can be the, uh, a cause for acute coronary syndrome in patients that have a lima or rima, 
uh, the CT and geography is uh, good to understand the vascular anatomy, what kind of arch you are dealing with, uh, if this would be a candidate for endovascular therapy or not, and uh, uh, what is the best approach, radial or femoral, and uh, 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 endovascular intervention is usually the kind of treatment in patients with subclavian artery stenosis, less invasive, good outcome compared to revascularization. Uh, we have data for 10-year patency that uh, showed excellent long-term uh, patency. And that's all. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Mahmoud. It was a marvelous uh, presentation uh, for an unusual uh, and awkward situation of uh, the patient uh, and um, a hell of a time accessing the artery. You gave us um, too many uh, tips and tricks uh, and very, very clever tips and tricks in uh, navigate, navigation and accessing the artery, step-by-step uh, -step approach for uh, doing the peripheral intervention. Uh, do we have any questions uh, from the YouTube? I think we've covered all the questions uh, that we need. So, um, and we've wrapped up. Thank you so much, Mahmoud, for uh, your effort. Thank and you. We are, uh, waiting, uh, and we're waiting for the other sessions to uh, give us uh, more specific details about um, the, uh, the other interventions, other preferred interventions uh, soon. Sure, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, uh, email me. I, I'll email the channel and they will get hold of me. I, I'm happy to share my email with anybody who wants to or who has a question. Thank you very much. Okay, and we're, we're, we're honored. We're honored.